All right. Today's guest is Wes Bush. He is the founder of the Product Led Institute and author of the book Product Led Growth. Wes, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. And I would like to start right off with probably a question you get asked a lot, which is like the context around this whole conversation we're about to have. Like, what is the definition around product led growth and why does it matter? Why does it matter now? Um, so we can get that out of the way and kind of dive deeper into, into uh, certain topics. Cool. Yeah, so I'll try and hit that out of the park and go through it quick. So product-led growth, what it is, uh, is probably something you're familiar with in a lot of different ways. The term itself is new, though. So I'll give you a couple examples. If you think of cologne, buying a car, shoes, they all have this one cool thing in common, whether it's like trying on a pair of shoes to see if it fits, whether it's before you make a purchase decision with a car, you want to test drive it, whether for cologne or perfume, it's like you want to sniff it, you know, see if it actually smells any good. And so all of those products, what they have in common is that they let you try before you buy. So a lot of people will think, oh, that's product led growth. And there's large truth to that. And that is a component of it. It's not the whole kimono though. So like most people will see like, ah, okay, that's, that's part of it. But product led growth is really, at the end of the day, it's a go-to-market strategy where you use your product for, to power your acquisition, your activation, your retention, uh, all the key areas of your business. So you're not just looking at your product and saying, huh, let's just like sell more of the product. No, you're thinking about how could we use this product to actually build a growth engine for our business. So um, I will definitely go through some examples later uh, in this chat of like how you could apply this to marketing, how you could apply this to you know, sales and what does that mindset look like and how you can think product led first um, through all those different departments. Um, but why it's of rising importance, I think is really, really fascinating. There's really uh, one personal one and then two macro trends that uh, they really kind of lean into this. And the first one is really just the fact that customer acquisition costs are rising for every business. It's never been easier to create a business. And so it just means it's getting more expensive to build and actually sell your products. And so on the other side of the spectrum is just that your consumer willingness to pay for tech is always going down. It's always been this way. Tech is deflationary in nature. And so you're seeing that reduction about 30% every five years, people want to pay less and less for better tech. And so those two first kind of tidal waves, I call them, are just clashing. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. if you don't change your approach to how you market and you sell your product, um, you're going to get caught in between those two tidal waves. And it's going to really be like this garbage compactor in Star Wars where they just get squished. Uh, luckily in Star Wars, they found a way out. And you can too with being product led, but uh, that's really what I'm advocating here is that product led growth is one of the ways that you can avoid that uh, and really thrive as a business. But the last kind of final reason of why product led growth is of rising importance is that the buying experience has changed. Uh, people, including you and me, whenever we think of products, we, we want to actually try them out, see if that product experience lines up with you know the copy that was promised. And so it's just become the expectation, even when selling to enterprise buyers, they want to see, can that product actually deliver on its promise? And so we have a lot higher expectations. Forrester did this, did this cool study on it, basically like three to four every B2B buyers would just rather self-educate than talk to someone in sales. And that's growing every year. So um, those are some of the reasons, you know, why product growth is of rising importance and the, the overview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the rising customer acquisition cost is something that we see across the board with every client we have. Um, when I was an in-house marketer as well, like it's, it's, it shows up not only with PPC, but really across the board. And um, so one thing that I was particularly fascinated by was whenever you talked about like time to value um, when doing onboarding um, or when somebody actually sniffs out um, your product 
if you want. Um, yeah. Can you talk a bit about like what you mean by time to value and why it's so important? Yeah, absolutely. So um, time to value and onboarding uh, are really the crux of building a successful product or growth strategy. So let's imagine you're a sales-led company and you're mostly selling to enterprise buyers right now. That's currently what you're doing. And you hear about product-led growth and you say to yourself, okay, we want to potentially go down this direction. We want to test it out. And so you see all these other product led businesses that have free trial, free models. And you're like, okay, we'll, we'll just pick one. We, you pick a free trial and then you just slap it on. People can go right into your product and then they can figure stuff out on their own. Now, if you were a sales led company, typically uh, if your ACB is over you know, 50K, uh, you're going to have some sort of like customer success rep onboarding your customers and helping them really see value from the product uh, when they do sign on as a customer. But when you become product led, um, that's no longer usually a luxury because uh, now you might have thousands of people signing up for your products who want to see the value, don't want to talk to people. And what can often happen is someone will sign up for your products. They don't get value. They're not going to come back. In fact, 40 to 60% of users who sign up for products that are product led and they don't experience any value whatsoever, they're, they're just not coming back ever. So it's a really uh, big churn <laughs> when you think of that. It's just a ton of people, mass exodus of people who just won't come back to your product. And so what you got to think about there is how do we tackle that? Why it's so important is obviously like if they don't come back a second time, you probably aren't going to get them as a customer. And so um, that's really why it's so important. We could dig deeper into what to do about that. If you want to improve your time to value, that's a whole nother fun can of worms. Um, but that is really why time to value is so important because if you don't get it for product like companies, it's basically game over. People just have no reason to come back. Your product didn't deliver on its promise. It didn't deliver any value whatsoever. And so you need to, to make sure that you have that first time user onboarding experience of fine tunes to help people get value. Mm. And I think one of the major things we should also probably talk about is um, when product-led growth makes sense? I mean, I mean, do you say it always makes sense? Do you say like, are there certain criteria you use in order to, when you talk to a client or when you talk to, um, I don't know, somebody in the community who asks like how they should start or if they should start, how, how do you evaluate the, I, don't, I would say like product-led readiness or something like that? Yeah, no, definitely. So, um, when you're thinking about like, hey, should we be product led or not? Can any business be product led? I really believe that any business can be product led, but what you got to think about is, is this the right conditions for it to be product led? And is this the right timing? So on the timing end, uh, one of the things to think about is, do you have product market fit? So typically product led companies, they're, they're built to scale. They have, mm -hmm. you know, touchless interfaces. You can get to value hopefully without talking to anyone. Um, but the path to getting there doesn't always look like this completely automated process. Um, a lot of sales led companies that are making the shift from sales led to product led, um, they're actually brute forcing it a lot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I love it whenever I see it because they might actually have this completely manual free trial process where, you know, you see a free trial call to action, then you request a free trial, then you have to hop on a call and get onboard on that free trial. And then they walk you through the steps and you can figure it out as well. So like there is steps to getting there. Um, but the product market fit is one of the big things that I would say once you you know you have it, you have some of those compelling reasons to be like, okay, we really need to, to scale up. Uh, the product-led go-to-market strategy is the most effective, efficient way to, to grow that business. Uh, once you get to that point, you want to be the first in the industry who has this because there's just so many more advantages you can access, like a wider top of funnel, a stronger growth engine, uh, and that's just scraping the surface. And so um, the other kind of thing to think about too is, as far as the condition is what kind of ocean are you in? 
if you're mm -hmm. in a red ocean where it's super competitive, everyone knows a space, let's say it's live chat software or something like that. It's like, okay, it's super competitive there. Um, product led is probably going to be one of the only ones you want to have because the customer acquisition costs in that space are consistently rising as things heat up, get more competitive. You want to have the most efficient go to market model. And if you're in a blue ocean though, things can change. I have seen product like companies thrive in this area too, if it's simple to understand, but in a blue ocean, if you're not familiar with what that is, that's a new market that you're creating net new demand. People haven't experienced this product before. This is AI before it was AI. <laughs> And so in this case, you might want to have your caution lights on and say, you know what? People don't quite understand uh, what our product is, how we're going to help people. So uh, a salesperson is so effective at this. They can understand the problem. They can challenge people, help them identify their problems. Uh, whereas in a red ocean, most people are like, ah, I need live chat software. I have this existing problem. We just like threw out the other product. It wasn't working. <laughs> we want another one. Right. And so people are going to buy way easier in a red ocean. Um, but a blue ocean does have a big opportunity to turn into a red ocean eventually. So you do need to understand uh, when it might be the right time if you are in a blue ocean to, to switch over to that product that model. So those are the, the two main ones that I would be thinking about is product market fit and what is your ocean condition? Mm -hmm. And I mean, when you talk about like sales led organizations, I mean, especially I was uh, before our conversation, we were saying a lot of the people um, listening to this podcast, um, they're kind of in the enterprise SaaS um, market or have um, ACVs above 50 or 100K. And what I hear a lot is like, yeah, but how should we do a free trial? Our software is too complex or we have an integration part that we need, right? Like there is like a almost a, consult, uh, a consulting part um, in, in, in the beginning in order to um, integrating with other software that you're already using and stuff like that. So what do you advise to companies who have maybe um, products that are a bit less self-serve, um, yeah, I mean, where it's diff more difficult to kind of just let someone jump in, um, even if you have tool tips and stuff like that, but um, where you maybe even need additional hardware or something like that. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of things that go into this. Uh, when you're making that transition from sales led to product led, uh, one of the biggest things that changes is you really need to focus on a different person that you're targeting. So most sales like companies, you're, you're going top down. So you're focusing on like the decision makers, the buyers, um, that's where you're told to go after. And so mm -hmm. um, let's say you're targeting the CEO and you're selling some like AI software. I like picking on AI software. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so in this case, the, the CEO is going to like, imagine they had a free trial. He, he signs up for the free trial and he's like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. This thing's complicated. I don't get it. Clearly a mismatch, right? right. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to work that well. Uh, whereas if let's say you have, you still have that AI software, but then you're targeting the AI software technician with the free trial. Now that technician is going to go and they'll be like, ah, you know, it's a little complicated. It wasn't the easiest software, but you know what? I built this really cool thing mm -hmm. and I'm really happy to share with my team. And so that person can get it. And so whenever you hear like, ah, it's super complicated. Yes. Yeah, sometimes that's just bad UX and that's fixable, but it's really often mostly because you're targeting the wrong person. You need to go from targeting buyers to targeting users. And what's cool about that from a marketing perspective is users are actually a lot more affordable to target at the end of the day, because everyone else uh, who has a SaaS business or whatever is targeting all of the decision makers and buyers at the top. So it doesn't mean you can just like necessarily have to be like, okay, we're not going to target any of these buyers whatsoever. Um, but it does mean the you switch to focus majority on the users. And so that's one of the big things that when goes into it, if you're saying like our software is complex, um, but then there's also other proactive things that I've seen too, where let's say there's a really heavy integration that, you know, it, mm -hmm. it just sucks. <laughs> like sometimes yes. for integrations, there's nothing you can do about it because it's not with your software. It's like, 
is this other software. Like we've worked with companies where um, they like basically plug into Zendex and then integrate with Amazon and pull all those messages in one place kind of thing. And like the Amazon integration just is really nasty. <laughs> and mm-hmm. So there's really limited stuff that we could do on that end. Um, but what we thought would be super helpful and what we've seen work is, okay, someone's on that particular page setting the integration for over like 30 seconds, boom, pop-up. And that pop-up has a call to action, which says, having trouble with setting up this integration, want a product expert to help set it up for you, a book a time with our product support. So like there is certain ways you can navigate around this, uh, even if the, the software and the integration stuff is completely out of your control, it's just knowing when you need to be helpful and being proactive about it. So um, and then the final one about that is just, yes, uh, one of the, the key skills most product-led companies are hiring for way earlier than their sales-led counterparts is just solid product design because they want to make sure that they have that user experience that is compelling, that is easy to understand so that they can lower their support costs and service more people. Mm-hmm. Well, when now that I'm like listening to you and kind of thinking myself into a scenario also when I'm working with customers, what I'm immediately like getting worried about, like, one of my main resources at the moment when I'm a marketer um, is my sales team and the, the kind of insights that they have because they constantly talk to customers. So, but like, how do you think about gathering feedback when going into a product led motion? Yeah. So what you basically have to switch from doing is like, okay, for uh, your sales team, there's going to be ways that they would monitor that feedback with us just through calls using something like Gong. And like, you could really, you know, package all that uh, data and like understand it and have those insights readily available. Um, When you're going product, like, usually you don't say goodbye to your sales team. <laughs> like you no longer have a job here. I have seen that in like a couple of cases, but it's very limited. And so whenever you're thinking about that, uh, you basically have to build this user research engine. So what that looks like, yes, there's different inputs, but you just need to understand like, what are the inputs you need to know if things are performing well, things are performing bad, and where there's areas of improvement. Those three things are where you need to understand your feedback. And so as far as the the first one, like, okay, uh, what do people want? Um, that one, like I've seen so many product guide companies do this. Whenever you first sign up for the product or something like that, they just ask you, like, what are you hoping to accomplish here? And that could be asked in an email. It could be literally like the form pops up after you sign up, like, congrats, we just want to know more about you kind of thing. And so you can integrate it and embed it in ways where uh, it feels personable. It feels easy for someone to reach out. And then there's just really looking at what people are doing. Um, so many product led companies use tools that uh, like for user recordings and stuff like that. I know uh, one of our product led coaches, uh, he used to work at Wistia and like they would just have every Friday, their growth team would just look <laughs> over lunch at these user recordings of people signing up for the software and be like, oh, like why? That was fixed. <laughs> and then right. they're like, oh no, it wasn't. And mm-hmm. so it just like builds user empathy. And so that's one of the biggest things that um, is a cultural norm in product that businesses. That's not always the case in sales at companies. And so that's something that you really do need to shift is like, what are some of those activities and ways um, that we could build that user empathy with users. I know um, Ahrefs, their marketing team, everyone has to do support one day a month. And mm-hmm. it's really brilliant because it's just yep. like, hey, how can you get your ear to the ground as far as like, what do the users want? How do we get that feedback and support is really um, like takes a lot of that feedback uh, that which you might hear from sales um, in a product-led business. So tapping into support is a really smart idea. Mm -hmm. Now, when we go into, into like the practical thing, like, let's say I, I currently have a sales team that um, let's say they do like 60 to 70% of the revenue is coming directly from, from sales. And then the others are coming um, 
ideally uh, from marketing through the whole MQL, SQL um, yeah. funnel. And so that's kind of the status quo. And then um, Wes comes in and says, like, let's try out this <laughs> uh, product-led motion. Where do I start? What's the, what are the first two, three steps? Like, because you cannot go all in, right? Like trial, all the users are doing yeah. trial immediately and stuff like that. So where do you start? Yeah, so I think the, the first one, if you're thinking about this, and it's not even called product-led growth. It's first principles. Like, what are the first principles of your business that you care about? And if we dissect companies like Amazon that everyone can probably understand, it's like one of their core first principles is people will always want to get their packages faster. Great. Okay. So as a business, what do you do to do that? Like Amazon's case, they're building distribution centers around every big major city. It's like, that's huge. But in your product, uh, think about it. every user wants to experience the value of a product faster. Same thing different label. And what are you going to do to do that? And so that might be building a faster user, like user experience for people to get the first time value. Uh, it could be, you know, shortening your customer success calls from, you know, required four calls to just one and like really going through this stuff. It might be any number of those things. You can be get creative about it. But the important thing is, what are the first principles of your business that matter? And when you focus in on them, it's going to lead you in this direction anyways, because this is all about how can we manufacture successful users within our product? Um, because the core kind of tenant of building a product of business um, is really just that your end user success will eventually become your success. That's really what product-led growth is all about. And so if you understand that part, it's going to lead you in that direction anyways of like building a better armor experience, having whether it's a free trial or free model or something that people can easily start with and then move on. Um, so that's the, the first step is identify the first principles of your business. Um, the second stage is really just to open up your eyes. Think about, okay, what are the best user experiences out there that we could even uh, replicate. It doesn't have to be exact competitors or anything like that. Just ask your, your leadership team and everyone on your team, be like, out of all the products you've ever tested out, which one stood out to you as the best user experience? Because that's really another core part of building a product and business. You want to create something that people love to use. They, they basically, if they're at work even, they're like, oh, I love this product and I want to get more of it. And so that's really the, what you try and do when you have that list is just dissect. So what went into it? Uh, was it something like that? Was it their marketing? Was it their product experience? What was it that really went into that? And so you're just trying to look for patterns. And so um, the third stage is really you need to have someone who's going to lead this. This could literally just be mm -hmm. starts off with tasking someone on the leadership team be like, hey, could you take the lead on exploring this, researching this, read everything you can about this, go deep on it. And usually what happens is that person will start part-time on this. They're going to start uh, exploring it. And eventually they're going to have to um, build their own product growth team, which typically has like a, a marketer, someone on growth side, designer, and also an engineer to actually launch some of these experiments mm -hmm. into the market, test it. And when they start getting some small wins, they can take some bigger swings and, and move forward with this. So that's typically the first probably five steps. <laughs> I went over the three. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's interesting. So when you say the, this first person, and I mean, you also have kind of a certification process yep. um, um, on your on your website, productlet.com. Who are like, what is this group of people who 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 take this certification or who start these kind of programs inside of companies? Like, who are those people? if you would have to say. Yeah, totally. So it's usually it starts with senior product leadership. Um, they're the ones who are thinking about this ahead of time and being like, we need to evolve the way we, we sell our product and how it goes to market. And then beyond that, it really is everyone on the team. You need to have your marketers bought in as far as 
how do we think about the product and help it use the product to generate more signups for what we're doing? And from the sales team too, that's a really big one because uh, sales kind of gets squeezed in some ways because, hey, they're building a product that sells itself. Does that mean I'm out of a job? Right. And mm -hmm. so there's this initial resistance to it. But eventually what they start to realize is sales becomes the biggest advocate because they're not dealing with all those small accounts that just take up all their time and they, they're not worth much, but no, they get to focus on the bigger enterprise customers and providing support where they're needed. And so um, it really is important that you get alignment around all the core major teams. And so that first big uh, kind of task and why we built that certification program was for that build a product that sells itself because that's the biggest thing that you need to focus mm -hmm. in on in the early days to get that initial adoption and get alignment around what's required to actually do that. Right. And also, like, if you talk about targeting the users versus the decision makers, it's also... Yeah. Usually the salespeople are the ones that are going for the decision makers, right? Not necessarily for for the users. So that's also a, a um, I guess, a conversation to be had. So for me, the interesting thing is then, okay, you have, I guess, product qualified lead in a way. There are certain yep. markers. They have um, kind of uh, gone through certain gates that are predefined and um, are flagged in a CRM or something like that. And then is at that point sales coming in and then talking to the user or are we, is the sales team then saying like, oh, okay, so this account has like uh, four people already uh, dabbling in our product. Let me talk yeah. to the decision makers or how does this handover take place? Yeah, so it depends for every business, but I'll give you an idea for um, companies who have both enterprise and like SMB mid market companies. Mm -hmm. So, product qualified leads, if anyone doesn't know, like it is very similar to marketing qualified lead in the sense that you're looking for qualified prospects. You have like the right demographics and right fit for your business, but you're taking it one step further by really looking at what are they doing in the product. Now, if you set up a product qualified lead the right way, <laughs> <laughs> have seen so many other ways, but the right way, not to say there is always one right way, but one of the best ways is you're going to look at who has experienced the value in the product. If you tie to that, it's going to be amazing. And so when you look at those product qualified leads, uh, there's still that demographic part that you need to take into consideration. Like, hey, if this is a startup with under 10 people, do we want to send them to sales even? Hmm. And if it's a big enterprise with over a thousand people, of course, <laughs> we want to send them to sales. And so that's the, the big kind of split when you're thinking of, okay, you made this transition from the sales at a product that now you're working out how it works internally with your sales team. The way I've seen it work best is you have a high touch and then a low touch option. And so uh, your high touch sales team, they'll be focused on those big enterprise accounts. Um, in fact, not much really changes for them too much. They will be getting some of these product qualified leads and be having more exposure as far as, okay, they can right. see who's in the accounts and reach out to the right person. Um, but their sales process largely stays uh, similar to what it was in the past. However, for the low touch uh, sales team, what they're really looking for is, okay, these mid-market accounts. So in your high touch sales team, each sales rep might only have, you know, like 10 or 50, like kind of big target accounts. Uh, whereas in your uh, low touch, they might have a hundred or a thousand of these accounts that they're really monitoring and kind of looking at and seeing who can I help best today mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so the product provide lead is one of the ways that they're going to be able to do that and who's the most active. Um, also, they're looking at velocity. How quickly did this person breach the limits and get to value? If you think of Slack, perfect example. So Slack has this 10,000 message limit. Now, if a company hits that limit in, let's say, a couple of weeks or something like that, like, man, are they ever getting a ton of value out of Slack or they're a spammer? So <laughs> it's really one or the other. And so you can really understand who to prioritize. And so that's the split. And that's how you can approach it for your sales team. Mm. And then also probably for, I mean, at the moment when you never 
when you can never experience the product, you can only educate yourself so much about the product, right? And so yeah. if there is a sales conversation, I guess a user is probably typically a bit further in with uh, being able to ask better questions at yeah. that stage. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, like Drift, their previous product qualified lead metric was someone who had um, sent a hundred messages on their website. So that means like they, they received a hundred messages with their drift widget, and then they respond to those hundred messages. And so, um, yeah. whenever their sales team reached out to them, there was like that 20, 30% close rate, which is just amazing. Right. And so you're just looking for like, what are the patterns, uh, the key things someone has to do to really, uh, fine tune that timing of when it is the right time to reach out, uh, because you don't want to reach out too early, like a message to be like, Hey, Sally, I heard you got tons of value. Right. <laughs> you're like, Hey, chill. <laughs> like, this is just interesting. I'm looking <laughs> these right. messages don't quite get the flow of it. I don't know how valuable this thing is. Uh, or anything. So um, the timing on it is important to tweak over time. Yeah, I mean, t uh, t talk a bit about that. Like, what are terrible metrics? You know, like what what should we not um, measure when we go into product qualified lead measures? Like, what's not yeah. relevant? So <laughs> that's when I was mentioning, like, what's the right way? Uh, well, one of the wrong ways <laughs> mm -hmm. is just calling it a sign up. So, like, a sign up is someone who clearly just signed up for your product. It's not a product qualified lead, not even right. close. Like it is, you do have to do more work within the product to, to get to yeah. that point. Um, I do see some teams just pick something like that because they don't quite have the um, product analytics set up and they just want to have something so they can monitor yeah. this and start tracking it. And I think that's absolutely fine. I actually mm -hmm. recommend that because it's better to start with something and evolve it over time than just be like, uh, you know, We'll never get it. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It's like, come on. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be so helpful for you in the long term. And one of the other cool things about product qualified leads, uh, I call it like the unifying metric of product led growth because every team has a part in it. Your marketing team is going to start looking at, hey, which campaigns drove product qualified leads? Because those ones are really important. You know that trade show we sponsored the party at? Yeah. Yeah, surprisingly, it didn't generate any of mm -hmm. those product qualified leads. Fancy that. Let's not do that again. Uh, whereas your sales team, they're going to start looking at, okay, um, you know, those MQLs, they're okay. But, you know, give me as many of those product qualified leads ever because they close like hotcakes. I want more of them. And so you're, they're going to be looking at them to say, okay, what is going on? How can I get more of them? Your support team and product team can then be looking at, okay, from sign up to product qualified mm -hmm. lead ratio, what percentage of them didn't make it? And your product team can start saying, okay, like, are, we're only getting 10% of these people to, to value. That's not good enough. We can do better and trying to get that as high as possible. And what's great about that is, is just like everyone is ultimately focused on how can we help our users become successful? How do we attract the right users? How do we convert the right users? Uh, and ultimately, how do we serve them better? So um, that's why I think it's really an important metric you must have if you're going to go down this product-led path. And if you're sales-led, start tracking it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, actually, um, so what do you think are some triggers that you see out in the wild where people are like, you know, something needs to change and I, I kind of dive in, I dive deeper into product-led growth or this whole topic. Like, what are some triggers that are why are people coming to you? Why are people coming to um, the Academy, uh, reading your book? Um, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of them are like those tidal waves I was talking about earlier. Like they're realizing their customer acquisition costs are rising. They're mm -hmm. also looking at, you know, customer willingness to pay is also less. And it does feel like a slog for a lot of companies. I mean, when we look at the MarTech landscape, famous thing, there's like 5,233% growth in that one industry um, over the last eight years. So it's just like crazy growth in all these industries. Uh, but what's really, I think the big thing is there's, there's two things going on. There's one, yes, those scary reasons <laughs> mm -hmm. of like why you might want to consider it. Um, but the other part that I I'm finding more and more companies leaning into is just, 
the benefits and they start hearing, oh my goodness, like, what is it like actually running a product like business? There are so many stories now through uh, our program, as well as just out in the, the wild for product like companies sharing, like reducing your cost acquisition cost by like 200% uh, when you made their switch from sales at a product led. There's uh, as soon as they launched a free trial, they saw, you know, 20 to 30% more signups every single month um, mm -hmm. without changing anything else on their website. And then there's also just looking at, oh, this company improves their signup flow and saw, you know, 20% boost in their MRR. And so there's lots of these stories that, um, you know, you might not get all of these benefits. That's okay. But even if you just got one of them, would it be worth it to your business if you went down this path and considered it? So I think there's that allure <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. That's attracting a lot more companies to this direction. Um, but it's also like, would you rather run towards something or run away from something? And I think more people want to run towards something that's exciting, that's genuinely going to help their business and genuinely going to help more customers. Um, than be like, I'm going to be forced into this position one way or another. Mm. How, how, how do you strike the balance between, because I've seen, and maybe you can mention some examples, um, how do you strike the balance between um, the kind of call to actions that people take on a, on, a, on a website? So let's say you got them through LinkedIn or you got them through Google Ad or you got them through whatever channel and they're landing on your website. And I've seen quite a few cases in B2B now where they have both the demo, but also the kind of trial um yeah. mm -hmm. uh, side by side and both in terms of like um, ad spend but also in terms of just mm -hmm. visual hierarchy and so forth like how how do you kind of balance that um, or what have you seen people um, doing or thinking about and maybe some examples also that that you like yeah for sure so um, when you're striking that balance um, early on you're probably going to have like the free trial uh, option is like more of the secondary option because you want to limit the amount of traffic it gets. You want to test it out and see if it's working um, and really just kind of going from there. And so that's how you'll typically see it. It's like introduced as the secondary option. Uh, but then over time, if it starts outperforming the, the demo process and your company and believes in it and everything else like that, you're seeing like really good results. Um, typically you'll see that take over eventually as the primary call to action. And so um, that's really interesting. But then what you also, I've seen quite a bit too, is with a lot of like enrichment tools um, that are available to companies nowadays, there's also this choose your own adventure style. And I think that's really going to be part of the future as well. Like if let's say, you know what, you're targeting Dell and okay, the CEO signs up or goes through the process. Um, it'd be nice if they have the option, like, Hey, you have two options would you prefer to talk to a product specialist um, about this? Or would you like to just go see for yourself what this product is all about? And so I really am seeing that as like a really compelling option for a lot of companies to be like, hey, let's have a hand raiser within this process. If they want to, to talk to us, they can. Mm. Um, but what most companies are seeing is that there is predominantly, most people just want to self-educate as long as possible. Um, and then finding that timing of, okay, when does it make sense for sales to reach out? Um, that's really the, the tricky part. And there's one kind of like rule of thumb that I recommend for any company to consider when you're thinking about when to embed sales in your process or if you even need sales. And it's, you have to answer this question, which is, um, is your sales team adding value or friction? Now, if it's right at the very beginning, the only way people can talk to you and learn more about your product is through a demo. I, a firm advocate, you're adding friction. Um, and a lot of it, when you think of, oh, now they got to schedule a meeting with you. Oh, now they got to pass from the SDR to the account executive. It just goes on. And so um, that's a really interesting thing. Whereas if the salesperson's reaching out whenever they see, hey, this person is like in Slack's instance, they're hitting their 10,000 message limit and they're losing a access to about 10,000 messages per month. I might want to reach out to the person who set up the accounts and let them know that, hey, like if they, they don't sign up, they are actually going to lose 
access to important files. Uh, it would be a shame for that to happen. And so like that salesperson is adding a lot of value, I'd argue, and they can be proactive about it. So um, that's really a long-winded answer as far as the call to actions, how you can think about that strategy and roll out. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, like most people who are listening to this are marketing leaders. And so for me as a marketing leader, like what changes when you have this first person um, from product kind of putting together this team and there is a second call to action and like, so, and, and maybe there's a split test going on on the website, let's say 10% are going for the free trial or only see the free trial or something like that. Um, and now this team is um, seeing results and wants to grow and maybe may even make this like a, a, a major mo motion going forward. Where do I need to um, be proactive as a marketing leader and how can I support this and what changes for me as well? Cool. So I got four big changes, just wrote them down. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to go from MQL to PQL internally, as far as like what you're measuring, uh, you can still use market qualified leads, but like, what is the one you really wear your hat on and focus on product qualified leads should be there. And then targeting, go from targeting buyers to targeting users. Um, that's a really important distinction uh, that you do need to focus in on. Um, as far as your call to action, like we did talk about, it's not gonna be an overnight thing, but eventually you want to go from like your primary call to action is demo to whether it's free trial or free model or some free model, and then go from making white papers and eBooks uh, to really just driving as many free signups as possible. And so you'll typically see like these sales like companies have like some sort of email goal of lead generation, and it'll just be focused on like, okay, we just need free signups. This is what we focus on. This is our goal. Get a hundred thousand signups. <laughs> it becomes mm -hmm. really simple. Mm -hmm. And so when when you say we, uh, the marketing team is mostly kind of measured by how many product qualified leads are getting into the pipeline, are you saying that a lot of the content is then ungated and we are going away from kind of um, the whole ebook, gated ebook thing, which is probably a good thing, anyways? Yes. But like, <laughs> um, I mean, most common that we work with now or or um, kind of our ideal client um, is 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 focused on SQLs anyways for uh, even yeah. in the marketing team. So um, I guess the product qualified lead is something in between an MQL and an SQL um, um, in a way. Or how would you kind of where would you put the the, the product qualified lead? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of similar components to it. Like you are still looking at a lot of those things as far as, is this a good fit for our business? Uh, is this like good fit company uh, from demographics and all those other areas that you can tell um, that a sales qualified lead would have. But the only difference is instead of sales qualifying it, it's the product that's qualifying it. Mm -hmm. And so you're okay. looking at, okay, what are they doing in the product? And uh, versus, okay, uh, Jim talked to them and they seem like a good fit. They have this burning need. They, they need to talk to us. You're looking at, oh, wow, they're really utilizing this product. Seems like they have a really big need because, wow, they, they've got to that 10,000 messages really quickly. They must have had something internally where they just couldn't communicate with email. Who mm -hmm. would have known? Uh, so yeah, that's <laughs> the big difference there. It's also cool. Like, I mean, the thing is, um, I'm a lot working also in, in demand creations so around content and stuff like that. And when you only have a demo, like it's, it's a hard sell from like a content piece to a demo Bottom piece, of funnel, right? Yes. It's, it's, it's a top. And so, um, I feel like mm, putting the, the kind of call to actions within, if we say we don't create any content, but we still have very valuable content, um, the step of like, I think ProfitWell, for example, does this really well. Yeah. Um, it's a super valuable product upfront and they kind of plug it into their content everywhere and it's super low friction to actually just sign up and, and, and yeah. try it out. Um, how, how would you integrate this kind of call, uh, where and how would you integrate this kind of call to actions 
two trials um, uh, if you're like in marketing and saying, oh, we, we abolish MQLs, um, the, the traditional ones coming from uh, ebook downloads and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily going to be like an overnight kind of deal. Um, ideally, yeah, but there's a lot of work that goes into those uh, lead scoring and old systems of like, okay, do we just gate everything? Do we turn all these white papers into blog posts and like use that to fuel our organic engine kind of thing? There's a lot of decisions that go into that. And you're totally onto something as far as like, yeah, I feel like as far as uh, space is headed and where everyone wants to go is like, yes, less ebooks, more just value <laughs> through mm -hmm. using the product. Um, when I think of even Slack, I've been using this example a lot because people understand it, but yes. um, most of us didn't start with reading a white paper on Slack. Right. And we started, either we got an invite from someone or we heard about it, we wanted to check it out, we signed up for it and started inviting people ourselves. And so that's how we experienced the value is actually way quicker than a white paper. And mm -hmm. so um, that is one of the, the big kind of sh transitions as far as the, the tracking go from MQLs to BQLs. Um, it's really not going to be overnight. Most marketing teams uh, that I've seen for product like companies, they have two main metrics. One of them is the number of signups they generated for the free product. And then two is the number of product qualified leads, which is their quality metric. And so um, the goal is obviously to keep it as simple as possible and then give them the creativity to figure out how to really get as many users as possible so there is more signups eventually. Mm -hmm. one, one thing I see in enterprise um, a lot that or at least it has picked up, is this kind of clickable demos almost. It's not really right. a trial, but um, I'm sometimes a bit afraid when I see this instance that it actually turns away people because you're kind of seeing an instance and you maybe yeah. had something else in mind and now and then you have this, some, at least what I've seen, kind of terrible UI of this clickable thing and you don't know what's going on. Why can you not click everywhere and stuff like that? Um, yeah. So... What's your take on that? Like, is that a good first step um, or, or not? Like, what's. Yeah, it's a bit of a gray zone um, in some ways. So, I think the ideal version for most users, especially if it's an easy to use product, is just get your hands dirty, get in the product, see if it's a good fit for you. If yeah. you like it, great. You can buy it if you want to continue to access to it or not. That's a great relationship uh, with a product uh, to kick things off. I think it, it gets a bit more convoluted though, whenever you do have those very big enterprise products and you're thinking, oh man, this is super complicated. Um, and the time to value on it is super long. I'll right. give you an example of a product that um, has used this approach and done really well. They just went public last week, Amplitude. And so Amplitude product analytics software, um, they do other things, but that's the main thing. And whenever you sign up, most people who sign up are like product managers. They want to understand what's going on in the product better. And so they sign up and then uh, they would have to basically install the code snippet in the product, right. set up the events right. And most product managers aren't that technical. And so then this just overwhelms them. And then they have to send it to a developer. And the developer's like, oh, you know, our release cycle's not until like next year. I'm not saying it's a full <laughs> year, but <laughs> some enterprises, it can be a long time. And so mm -hmm. um, then they're just left there scratching their head. They're like, our 30 day trial's up. Do we purchase it or not? We we don't know if it's good. Um, and then they even add free model. So it's like, oh, but still, I, I don't know what it's going to look like. Now, alternatively, you could just go in to one of these, you know, product tours of what it would look like and a couple of clicks, they're like, oh, that's what my dashboard for the product could look like. Hmm, interesting. Oh, that's what the retention cohort analysis could look like. Fascinating. That would be cool. And so it's never going to be as compelling, like, wow, look at all those insights because it actually takes quite a bit of time to get that right. And I have seen other companies like Mixpanel. Uh, where they have these, you know, Chrome extensions that make it easier to track stuff. But I've also seen <laughs> some hilarious signup numbers with that metric because it was just like, well, the developer used the same like tag on a lot of different things. And like, it's just 
didn't work. And so right. there is risks of creating a faster time to value in some of those areas too, when you think about it. So um, that's one example where it can absolutely work. And as you're thinking about that transition from sales side to product led, I think it is a really good next step to, to test it out. If you want something quick and dirty, where it's like, Hey, we can get people to at least see what the product is all about without signing up for a demo to your point, uh, as a marketer, this is attracting someone who's not even at the stage of someone who's ready for a demo. They're earlier in the funnel, which mm -hmm. is exactly what you're going to get access to when you go product led as well. Um, so I think it is great from that perspective, you're going to get more leads, uh, but it might just not be as powerful for someone to be like, wow, I want to get this. Uh, it depends on your, your problem though. Right. Do you also, um, consider stuff like this famous like w website creator from HubSpot or like, um, I was still called, I think Pablo, it was called from Buffer that is like kind of a site tool, but yeah. you also get signups and it's maybe auxiliary to like w the, the product, um, um, that you're actually selling. What do you think about like, what do you call that actually? <laughs> and then, um, what do you think about those kind of tools? Does this qualify for this whole product-led growth approach and how does it fit in? Yeah, no, definitely. So I'll share a personal experience first and I'll share another example that's a bit more marketing centric. So uh, when I was working at Vidyard, video hosting platform, um, they initially just had a free trial for their main product. And so if you thought about it, it was actually a kind of a uh, strange way to set it up because someone would sign up for the free trial, they'd have 14 days, and then they would have to basically upload their own video, um, embed it on their site, and then they could get the analytics for the video. So there was actually quite a bit of steps there um, mm -hmm. that someone who was just willy nilly signing up would be like, oh shoot, I got to bring my own video and get this up on the site. And then I can see like you know, 10 people saw it, unless it's the mm -hmm. homepage, which you probably wouldn't want to test it on anyways. Right. Um, so there was a, a big ask on that end. And so what we actually ended up doing is launching a, another alternative product that was complimentary. So it's called viewed it and it was just a Chrome extension and mm -hmm. you could click it and record your screen and send it to your prospects, coworkers, whoever. And you can immediately see, uh, you get a notification, your Gmail and be like, Hey, this person watched 98% of your videos. So like it was really an easy, quick way for you to showcase the value. And all of those videos eventually went into the main product. So you could see even more analytics mm. and get a faster time to value through that end. And so um, if you're stuck with your current product, you might be thinking, huh, what could be a good complimentary uh, way to, to accelerate that? And it all comes down to the customer journey. Like what are the beginner problems of your okay. customer? What are the intermediate ones? What are the advanced ones? Like at Vidyard, we were trying to be product led with the intermediate problem, which was you have a video, you want to put it on your sites and get analytics. The beginner problem was you don't have a video. <laughs> mm -hmm. You need to make a video. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so you had to do that step first. And so that's really the, uh, the best place for you to build a product led business or a new product, uh, is in that beginner problem set. Um, I'll give you another example for that. So convert kit, their email marketing platform do amazing things. Um, but back to that example, the intermediate problem was they were trying to help people send emails to their list, uh, as a creator and make a full time living from it. And so that was their goal. That was their mission. Um, but then they went back to the drawing board and said, um, okay, how do we grow our business? How do we get more leads and more people who want to do this? And they started looking at that beginner problem set. And one of the problem sets of building a list is we need emails. How do you get emails? Well, you need something to, to get them to do that. Yes, there's forms, um, but you're not just going to necessarily put up a form on a website because you got to build that website. So like they're talking like the V1 creator here who doesn't have a website, doesn't have something like that. So they need a landing page. And so they started there and said, let's just create a free landing page tool. And it's going to help 
everyone who has access to ConvertKit for free get access to more emails if they use these tools. They're pre-vetted templates. They work. Just edit the copy. You can do it in five minutes. And that was way more effective than writing a thousand blog posts on <laughs> landing pages or creating more eBooks and white papers on how to build great landing pages. It was just, here's the product, try it out for yourself, build the thing and get results. I love that. Yeah, it's basically, um, I, the, the last sentence I think, I think is the key. Like you, you have to make the decision between, should I create a bunch more content or should I create a tool maybe for the same amount of money and, and time investment actually, um, over if you, if you, if you look out over a year. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so maybe I think we have to, um, close the conversation soon. Um, so when you, when you think about like marketing product and sales kind of having to sign up for this whole program. And one thing that I know from a marketing leader perspective is it's, it's, it's always a tough, if you need to go to your boss and say like, Hey, I want to try something revolutionary new, yes. even if it's, you know, it, it sounds revolutionary oftentimes, right. Even if it's like, uh, you know, freemiums and free trials have been out there for a long time. What are some arguments that you have seen that work really well? Or like, what are some hard hitting slides um, that, <laughs> um, that you, that you've seen out there that work really well? Yeah. I mean, if people sign up for our program, we try and give them access to like this, what we call a kick-ass email template that goes through all uh, the benefits of product that go to send to your uh -huh. manager. But um, the basic thing is like, you don't necessarily have to make a revolution. There's this quote I love, which is, it's an evolution, not a revolution. And mm -hmm. whenever it comes to uh, being product-led, I think that's really important for business is like, yes, it may feel like a revolution, but it should be. Uh, more of an evolution. The difference is like a revolution usually has like some sort of crazy leader that's like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. let's kill everyone. And it's like, no, 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 yeah, yeah, stop yeah. it. <laughs> that's stupid. And mm -hmm. evolution is like, okay, we're just evolving, we're iterating. And that's one of the core things of any great product led business or any business period is you're just yeah. always iterating. Um, so, one thing I'll add as far as like, since I know a lot of your listeners have enterprise companies um, and are potentially thinking of making this transition from sales that are product led um, is you might, it might even take you a few years to even feel close to being like, Hey, we are product led, even if you start today on that journey. And so when you're early stage starting out, start with like, what are the, the low stakes items? So if you started improving your onboarding experience and could help your users uh, get the value faster in your product. You're going to be able to monitor that and see wins in your MPS. You're going to be, you'd be able to see, hey, people are sticking around longer. People are getting more value. So there's tons of ways that you could start without rocking the boat too much. Um, because what's so important about that is starting small, one, um, but you're going to be associated as someone who is getting the wins on the team. And people always want to be associated with uh, that team that is helping really change the business in a positive way. And you can get a lot more people behind it because um, this may start in the product or marketing team for a lot of companies, but you do have to get everyone else aligned and bought into it. Um, and showcasing those ones is the easiest way to do that. Perfect. And so tying in where you want to send people, um, most of the people here listening are marketers and to listen to this, they're like, oh yeah, hell yeah. Let's start with this. <laughs> um, it's probably not going to be me, but um, I'm sending my product managers um, some resources. Where do they start? Like what's the first touch? The first touch. All right. So yes. if you're gung ho, this feels like something you want to test out and explore. The first thing is read the book, Product Led Growth. I just start there. It goes through this whole approach in more details. I was actually like, I had written it for one of my clients who's making this transition from sales at a product that. So like, you're going to find so many things uh, relevant to you. And then if this is something that you seriously want to consider, even after that, um, take our product at growth program. 
Uh, it's literally going to help you just build that product that sells itself, that V1 version, that messy version, um, but it'll work. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was a really great conversation. I think it adds a lot to um, also kind of the marketer understanding of what's going on with this whole product-led growth motion that everybody's talking about. Thank you very awesome. much, Wes, for your time. No worries. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you.